Okay. Okay, so thank, thank you all for having me. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to discuss some of my passion with you. Um, I'm gonna talk today about uh, landscapes, uh, shooting time-lapse landscapes and infrared landscapes. Um, so hopefully this is of interest to you guys. Um, so a little bit about myself before we get started. Um, I am a master photographer and certified professional photographer. Um, unfortunately, I'm not a full-time photographer, so I have a day job and um, that keeps me very, very busy. And photography to me is a passion that um, helps me cope with the boringness of my day job. And um, so this is a quote that, uh, you know, in one of my images that uh, reminds me of this quote, um, really the reason that I do photography is to be able to exercise my creativity. And, um, and if anybody's familiar with the idea of flow, um, I find it uh, to be very uh, interesting when I, when I get a chance to shoot, um, I'm not one of those guys that will just grab a camera and go out and, and shoot for five minutes and get a lot out of it necessarily, but I more like to immerse myself in the idea of a uh, photo shoot. So this particular image is from White Pockets in uh, Utah, um, and it actually might be, it's on, right on the border of Utah and Arizona. And um, I had the wonderful pleasure of spending a couple of days there with my friend Olus Garber and a few other people. And um, we were able to go out into the into this landscape and you know just spend hours at a time basically alone and uh, sometimes with each other uh, shooting different elements of the landscape and you know I was able to just go into complete flow and forget about everything else in my life uh, except for photography and I find that to be the main reason that I do photography is that escape and that ability to do my creativity so hopefully I can help you guys uh, understand some ideas for um, exercising different types of creativity with your photography today with some of the things I'm going to talk to you about. So um, here's a quick agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about time lapse first. Um, what is a time lapse? Why would I want to do one? Uh, how do I shoot one? And what are the steps to process that into a movie? And then we'll talk a little bit about infrared photography. I'll talk about what it is and how you might want to get started and why you might want to do it. So um, what is a time lapse? So a time lapse is really just capturing a sequence of frames and uh, that you capture over a period of time and then stitching them together. Um, so there's different reasons that you might want to do this. Um, you can see, you can stitch images together for different times. For instance, if you want to shoot a Milky Way scene, you can shoot images through the blue hour and then into the dark with the Milky Way and then blend images that you pick uh, from that whole sequence. Um, sometimes you get very subtle uh, changes um, or quick changes uh, that you can capture that you don't really get in a single still image. Um, sometimes, you know, if you're capturing a sunset or a sunrise, if you capture it in a time lapse or in a, in a series of images, you can go back and pick the best one uh, that has just the right color and, and elements that you can use. And again, you can also blend them. Um, I'm not going to talk about this much today, but you know, there are ways to take multiple images of the same scene, for instance, a tourist attraction, and there are tips and um, or tricks in Photoshop where you can blend out uh, the, the tourists or something like that from a particular tourist attraction. And then, of course, really cool time lapse movies, which is part of the reason that I do it. Um, so just uh, some of the equipment that I use. A lot of it's the basic equipment that you would have anyway, you know, obviously your camera, your tripod. Um, I use uh, really right stuff tripods and the ball head. Um, I find the leveling base uh, on the really right stuff is a very important element, not only for time lapse, but also for shooting landscapes. To be able to level that head on that base uh, um, uh, really easily is, is is a really great feature. Um, of course, various lenses, mostly for time lapses, I'm doing uh, wide angle lenses for the most part. I typically like to shoot fast lenses uh, for most scenes, especially if I'm shooting night scenes. Um, sometimes I want to use the, the, the filters. Uh, you know, you need to use the ND filters so that you can, you know, get your exposure times correct. And then, of course, the intervalometer is an important part. And I've mentioned a few different intervalometers here. There's, of course, the, the regular Nikon. By the way, I'm a Nikon shooter. I apologize to any of your, your Canon guys out there or your Sony, Sony guys. Um, but um, 
I find that you know the Nikon and the Velo um, uh, uh, intervalometers are great, uh, but there's some other ones out there on the market that you can play around with. And there's there seems like there's more every time I look. Um, there is this LR time lapse intervalometer, which is done by the guy that actually does LR time lapse, which is some software I'll talk about later. Um, it allows really short interval times, um, which can be really cool depending on what you're trying to capture. Uh, there's this fullography unleashed. Um, it, it's a tiny little gizmo it goes in your Nikon. They also have them for Canon. Um, and then you can control your camera just from your, uh, from an iOS device or, or from an Android device. And then uh, there's another tool that I've used, which is a QDLSR dashboard, uh, which is unfortunately is only for Android. Uh, so I had to buy a, an Android tablet to, to play around with that, but um, it's just software that you can download and it allows you to um, wirelessly control your, com your camera through that. Um, and it has some pretty cool features of ramping and things like that. So um, those are the tools. So let's talk about uh, your, your basic setup. So of course, you want to create a composition. So it's very similar to a still image. Again, you know, the rule of thirds and all of these things, but it, there's an added element here. You need to anticipate the changes that are going to happen, right? The whole idea of shooting interval type shooting or time lapse shooting um, is that you want to capture a change. So something has to be changing. So you need to understand what is the change that's happening. Is it people moving through the scene? Is it uh, the sun going down? Is it the Milky Way coming up? Is it, you know, some other event of clouds moving through. So you have to understand and think about how that scene is going to evolve and then anticipate that when you do the original composition. Um, and, I, and by the way, I'm not going to talk about, you know, some of the tools for creating composition. I think I know Olus has talked to you guys before about uh, some of the ways that he plans shoots. So that's uh, really good information to have. Um, Design and program the interval. So you have to talk about, you know, your shutter speed, how long of an interval you want between shots, um, the length of the shoot. Do you have to go sort of work backwards uh, for your time lapse to say, how long do I want my time lapse to be? And then, of course, you program the intervalometer and make sure you test what you're doing. And by the way, I'll, I, I, this, there's a lot of information here. I apologize. I you know it might feel like I'm giving you a whole bunch at once. I'm going to go back through a lot of these things and give you some more details behind all these. I'm sort of just building the, uh, the overall framework here first. So of course, set the, sam the, set the camera and the exposure and focus. Um, so there's some stuff called flicker and post-production methods that you have to worry about. And I, I have some slides, we'll talk about that. Um, Auto ISO is a big friend of uh, doing any sort of time lapse, especially if you have changing light conditions. So I'll talk about how to set those auto ISO limits and then how your camera uh, looks at those limits. And um, of course, manual focus is really your, your friend here. So make sure that you focus very carefully before you start the time lapse and have it on manual. You don't want your camera to have to redo focus every time because you can get inconsistent results with that. Uh, and finally, uh, review, test, make sure you lock everything down. Um, you know, all of these things are, are, are examples of mistakes that I've made. Uh, you know, you don't lock your tripod head down. You set, you set your time lapse to go. And the next thing you know, your time lapse looks like it's drifting off uh, because your, your camera head's not locked down. Um, so there's a lot of things to, to check and recheck and uh, test um, to make sure that you have everything set. So this is just the basics of interval shooting. And, and by the way, I'm using the term interval shooting and time-lapse shooting interchangeably here because time-lapse shooting is interval shooting. It's just a matter of what you do with the final product at the end. So, so some considerations um, when you're setting this up, um, and I've got the little time-lapse video here going on the side, um, which I'll show you uh, the, the end product of that in a, in a minute, uh, besides the time-lapse itself. So you need to consider your initial and final light conditions. So am I shooting a day-to-night transition, a night-to-day transition? Um, is it going to just be constant light throughout? Um, what is the speed or the amount of change that I'm trying to capture? So if you're trying to capture something like people moving or cars, or you know, you wanna have a, a shorter interval than if it's slow moving clouds. And then if you wanna do a Milky Way like this, you have to consider you know, what your final end state of that Milky Way is gonna be. And that's gonna determine the interval that you're gonna use, right? Unless you do some sort of interval ramping. And then you need to consider also in the end, am I just doing a time lapse or 
am I, do I really want to get some still images out of this that I want to blend together? Because the difference there might be, you know, how you approach your ISO and how you approach your exposure. Because if you're, expo if you're doing a time lapse, um, a little bit of blur in the images from the motion of the objects moving is okay. Um, but you really don't want blur if you're doing uh, straight up images. So let's see what I did with this. Hey, Keith, so here's an example image. Keith, Sorry, is there a question? Real, yes. quick, real quick question. There's a question about what is interval ramping? Can you talk about that for just a second? Yeah, so um, I don't have a slide on that. I didn't put anything together, but uh, interval ramping. So um, this is a perfect uh, example, the Milky Way. So as I'm capturing this Milky Way, when I set up the interval for this, I have to consider what my um, final exposure is going to be because I want to capture that Milky Way, right? So if we're going to capture the Milky Way, we know that we're probably going to have about a 15 second exposure time, 13, 15, maybe 17 second exposure time, uh, depending on what lens we're using. So that determines, unless I do interval ramping, which I'll explain in a second, that determines my overall um, uh, interval for the entire shoot. So as, as I, I'm going to see if this video restarts, I apologize, go back through here. So gosh darn it, I figure out how to restart this video there. So what that means is that as this goes through the day tr transition and the clouds are moving and all this, I'm still using a 15 second interval in this case, uh, because I know that I want to capture the Milky Way and that limits how I'm going to set up my overall exposure. So what exposure ramping is, back to your question, is you, you have to use a special intervalometer for this um, is basically to say, okay, I'm going to set my interval, you know, when it, uh, when it's light out to be a five second interval, because I want to capture those fast moving clouds. But then that interval needs to ramp up to 15 seconds when the Milky Way comes out. And so that adds a whole nother level of complexity to how you set up and shoot a scene and then how you process that scene. But it's something that you can definitely do that LR time lapse um, uh, in the QLSR dashboard and that N2 that I mentioned are uh, tools that you can use to do interval ramping. The Nikon and the Velo, the regular triggers, they're not going to do a ramped interval. They're just going to do a straight interval through the whole scene. Did I answer the question okay? I know it was kind of a long-winded answer, but it was a complicated question actually. You did, thank you. Okay, very good. So this was the this is an example of what I got out of that last time lapse or that interval uh, shooting. Besides the the time lapse that I processed, um, here's an image that I put together. So the way I collected this image was I took ten good Milky Way images uh, from the towards the end. You know, in the, w when the Milky Way was where I wanted it to be in the scene, I combined them using Starry Landscape Stacker. Um, and you know that adds uh, amplifies the Milky Way a bit and reduces some of the noise and then that, that outputs a single image and then in Photoshop I took one of the images from the blue hour and I blended that um, with that starry landscape image so um, it, that's how you can get detail in the foreground and also in the Milky Way in the same image. So there's two things that I got out of that. I got a nice time lapse to show the Milky Way coming up, but I also got a nice image um, uh, that uh, I believe I actually got a merit for this image. So um, um, that's one of the reasons you might want to do an interval. Now, you might not need to stay the whole time to do that interval, but you do need the blue hour and you do need uh, some good Milky Way images to put that all together. Okay. All right, so here's just another example uh, where you can capture just that image of the, 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 the sunset. So, you know, if you walked up and you saw that sunset, you might think, wow, that's really beautiful. Um, but you might not be able to go back and pick the exact image from that that you wanted. So I was able to, with this time lapse, uh, again, not only a nice time lapse, but um, I was able to go back and pick the exact image uh, from that that I thought was the most beautiful image of the color and use that for a single still image. All right, so some setup suggestions. So I've talked a little bit about uh, the intervals and setting the intervals. So there's a couple things to consider when you're setting up your time lapse or your interval shooting. Uh, the first thing you have to think about is, um, is the light, are the light conditions changing? Is it a day to night or a night to day? And that's gonna define a certain set of parameters that you're gonna to need to think about. And the second thing you need to think about is, am I just doing a time-lapse 
or do I want to get a nice image out of this? Um, because you might set up things a little bit different. So let's talk about a changing light condition, how we're going to shoot that. So we're going to use aperture priority. Uh, our shutter speed can be up to 30 seconds. And this, of course, depends on the light conditions. Um, the interval needs to be whatever your max shutter speed is, uh, plus two or three seconds. And that's going to allow for the buffer of your camera to do its thing between shots. And then finally, the important thing, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, the auto setting the auto ISO on the next slide, is um, you need to, to set the auto ISO to what you want for the scene. So um, if you are just doing a time lapse, you know, you can go up higher with your auto ISO and you can, uh, you know, get a little bit more um, grain in your image so that you get enough light in the scene. But if you're really trying to get a file that you want to then process into a still image, you probably want to limit your ISO settings to maybe 3200, depending on your camera, uh, so that you get a good clean image when it's dark um, that you can use. So the second one would be moving objects. So do we have things like people or cars or fast moving clouds or something like that? And then you ask yourself again, the same question, do I want a time-lapse or do I, am I trying to get a nice file out of this? So the reason this is important is if you're trying to do the time-lapse, a little bit of blur is okay. About a 50th of a second, uh, watching some blur and people moving through that, that's okay. Um, but if you really want files, you don't want any blur. So you want to, you know, use that rule of, you know, two X of focal length for your uh, shutter speed. Um, and then your interval, of course, is going to depend on the speed of motion of the scene. And I, I have something on the next slide. I'll discuss this in a little bit more detail. And I actually have an example of some different ones that I've shot at different uh, intervals and shutter speeds that, that we'll go through. Um, but again, the faster the motion, the shorter the interval. So if you want, you want to be able to capture that motion, so you have to sort of think about that. And then again, if you're using moving objects, probably you want as low as possible um, for the ISO settings. All right. So uh, a little bit more about the intervals. Um, again, I said, you know, the, the faster something moves, the shorter your interval needs to be. Uh, so if you have moving traffic, fast moving clouds, drive lapses, this is if you have in, in your car and you're doing a time lapse, um, ba basically a one second interval. Uh, one to three seconds if you're talking about sunsets, slower clouds, crowds, uh, maybe telephoto shots. Uh, Milky Way needs to be 15 to 30 second intervals, right? Star trails, um, things like that. And um, then if you're doing things like plants growing or construction projects, uh, you know, it could be on the order of hours or maybe even days. Um, very important to note, though, your interval needs to be your exposure time plus a bu buffer plus a frame interval. So uh, you need to allow this buffer of one to two seconds, um, especially in warmer climates, you know, where we are in Florida. Uh, that sensor has to cool down a little bit if you try to push it too hard um, or if you your camera can't process the images, you're going to lose images in your time lapse and then things aren't going to look right. So you, I always usually calculate about a two second buffer um, just to make things set. And then auto ISO settings. Uh, uh, this is this all goes into your auto ISO settings, which I'll talk about more in, in a couple slides. All right, so this is a video. Um, I'm going to let me actually pause real quick. Um, hopefully I can start again. So I want to explain what's in this video before I show it uh, so that you, you understand what we're looking at. So this is a video I shot down in St. Augustine at the Ford on a day, uh, on a nice sunny day with a bunch of clouds going by. And uh, I did it at different intervals and shutter speeds to sort of show you the difference. And I have this on YouTube. Um, it's a little hard to get some of the nuances out of this. And I find that people want me to show it multiple times sometimes. So I'm going to post the um, a, a link to this video uh, in the chat after the meeting. Uh, and uh, you guys can go back and look at it in more detail on YouTube. Uh, but again, we're going to look at different shutter speeds and different intervals and see how that impacts the final time lapse. Okay, so a two hundredth of a second. So that's going to be, you know, no blur really in the still images and two second interval. Um, so the people look okay. They look a little jerky to me. Um, so this is about half of that. So we get a little bit of blur in the people. Uh, same interval. Um, I kind of like this one better. I think it looks a little smoother. Um, 
And I think two seconds with the people is pretty good. Um, the next one is going to be even a little blurrier. I think it's a half a second. And so here you see the people that sort of look like they're blurring through the image a little bit. Um, I kind of like it's kind of a cool effect. It depends on what you're looking for. Um, it's not bad. Um, I think the 20th, 50th of a second is probably a better, uh, is a better frame rate. And then the next one's going to be at a, a four second interval. And you'll see every, obviously this is all processed about the same. So you see everything will speed up. Uh, it's, the frame rate here is I think 24 frames a second. So um, you'll see everything will speed up. I think, as I said, a 50th of a second, I think is about right for the people moving through the frame. Uh, the clouds are probably okay. Um, four seconds for the, the speed might be a little high. This is again at six second interval. And so this is a little bit faster. Maybe this is a little too jerky. I think that was the last one. So let me pause there. Are there any questions before I move on? I know I'm kind of covering a lot of technical stuff here. Keith, how long have you been doing uh, time-lapse photography? That's a good question. Um, a few years, um, maybe two years or three years. And how many do you think you have produced during that time? How many or how many good ones? <laughs> you know, I find that whenever I get a chance to really go out, I'm always shooting in an interval mode. Um, you know, usually um, I'm, I'm blessed uh, in my, my day job that bores the heck out of me, but um, uh, provides me a good enough income that I can have a few cameras. Um, I will almost always take one camera, set it up on a tripod, find a nice scene and just let it run. So how many have I produced? Um, 20, 30, 40, maybe something like that. Yeah, it's probably 30 or 40. Thanks. By the way, your iPhone will do a really nice time lapse. <laughs> if you put it on a tripod, it has a nice time lapse feature. I've done some short time lapses with it. It's, it's not bad. You can't edit it in the same way you can with the uh, with, uh, 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 still images, but it's still kind of neat. I'm sorry, was there another question? Okay. I guess I'm right. trying to understand. Hi, Keith. Hi. I'm trying to understand the setup and the camera. So you're setting an aperture priority. So, so you're, 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 you're leading me into my next slide. Okay. You, so maybe I'll it, be patient. Next, yes. Hold it for the next uh, okay. slide. <laughs> All, All right. right. All right. So I'm going to try to tell you how I do this with the aperture priority and what, what the camera does when I'm setting this up. Okay, so this took me a while to wrap my head around. So this is, um, I'm gonna go try to go through this slow and uh, please feel free to chime in with questions. All right, so here's what we have. We're gonna talk about setting up a day to night transition. So daylight savings roughly here, we're talking about 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. I'm gonna shoot a Milky Way. So this, is gonna, this is be about like what I did with that Milky Way shot I, I showed you um, in, in a previous slide. So this is about what the light's going to do, right? So at, at, at 4 p.m., you got 100% of the light. And then the light starts to trail off as you go into the night. So this is, let's assume this is summer and the light doesn't fully go away until, you know, 8 or 9 p.m., right? All right, so we're going to use aperture priority. I'm at f2.8. My auto ISO settings here are... 60 ISO is it set at 64. The max sensitivity of the auto ISO is set at 3200. The minimum shutter speed is set at 13 seconds. This is very, very, very important if you're doing a day to night transition. Your auto ISO settings are really where the magic happens. So the 64 is going to give me nice images through the blue hour. The max sensitivity is what I know my camera is going to do at um, how I'm going to shoot the Milky Way. I know that I'm going to sh be shooting the Milky Way at 3200 ISO in about 13 seconds. That's what I, I know because I've done it enough times. 
okay, at f2.8. You're, you're letting the camera determine the exposure. It, yeah, auto ISO, yes. Aperture priority, auto ISO, camera's doing its thing. I'm sorry, the shutter speed. Yes, to the limit of 13 seconds. That's what aperture priority does. Aperture priority says, lock me in at f2.8, do whatever you want with the shutter speed so that you make the image work right. Okay. Does it make sense? Right, I just wanna make sure that you're letting the camera control that and not the intervalometer or some other. Nope. Some nope. other Cameras. In this case, in this case, the camera is doing its thing. Okay. Okay. Um, interval, when I set up, and by the way, in this case, I don't even have an intervalometer. I'm using the camera intervalometer. Okay. I'm not even hooked up to an intervalometer at all. I'm using the, 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 um, intervalometer in the camera and I'm setting that at the 15 second interval and 750 images, maybe more, depending on how, how, how long I want to let it shoot. Sometimes I'll just set that a very high number because I know I'm never going to hit it and I just turn it off when I'm done. Okay. Exposure smoothing on, interval priority on. All right, so what, what happens as the light starts changing? What happens with your camera? What does your camera do? So the first thing your camera is gonna do is it's gonna change your shutter speed, okay? It's gonna leave your ISO at 64, and it's gonna start ramping up your shutter speed until it hits that 13 seconds, okay? So let's assume that happens somewhere around 7 p.m. So at 7 p.m., I have ISO 64. My shutter speed's 13 seconds. Now what happens? Your camera says, well, the only way now I can get your exposure the way you want it is by changing your ISO. And so it starts ramping your ISO until it, until it hits the, your 3200 max. Okay? Your camera does all of this for you. I set it and forget it. Walk away. Okay, does it make sense? I'm gonna pause and make sure that you guys get this. Um, Cause this is, this is kind of the magic of, you know, using a DLSR with no intervalometer and just setting it and letting it go for two or three hours. Does it make sense? Yep. It's all about I aperture have a question. So yes. I do have a question. So yes. if you're on auto ISO, why why would it not at um, 5 or 7 p.m. increase the ISO as opposed to the shutter speed? It's the way the camera works. The camera does the shutter speed first, and then it starts the ISO. Really? Okay. Yep. It's not, that's not a, that's, as far as I know, it's not something you can program. Now, um, some of those other tools that I mentioned, the QDLSR dashboard, the N2, um, those allow you to do different things where you can, um, you can do this manually. You can do, um, um, you know, you can manually set the exposure throughout. You can, uh, do what they call a Holy grail method, which, um, allows those to use different tools to uh, be able to set it. So if you want to ramp your ISO, if you want to ramp your aperture, you can do it. So there's a lot of other tools there. I don't use those very often. I've played around with the Holy Grail method. Um, I haven't found it to be that much better than this, um, it, it, at least in what I've done. So certainly if this is, if it's something you want to do and get started with, I find this works really well, especially for uh, shooting a day to night um, and with the Milky Way. And, it, and it's no additional tools really. It's just your camera and your tripod and, um, and getting it all set up. Okay. You must use a lot of mosquito repellent while you're out doing this. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Yes. <laughs> All right. So um, again, this is just sort of laying out what happens here. Your ISO is going to be 64 until about 7 PM where it starts to go up until it hits 3,200. And then your shutter speed is going to be a 10th of a second. And then it ramps up until it hits your maximum. And, and then it uh, peaks out at 13, which you, which you have said. Okay, so here's an example of doing just that. So it's a little slow getting started, but uh, it was a pretty fun night once it, uh, once it happened. 
I like watching the tide go down. You see the storms pop up on the horizon. Milky Way pops out. You can see in the foreground, the tide tides way down at that point. So in this case, I used uh, 25,000 uh, uh, ISO. So you could still see details in that foreground. Um, but if I, I, I couldn't go back and use any of those images uh, for um, individual frames. It was just too high, the ISO. But it made for a nice time lapse in the end. So a little, um, Gene, to your question, a little behind the scenes. Um, this was the same night. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that particular um, night, you know, it was about, uh, that was on the west coast of Florida. It was about 10 to 12 hours uh, door to door. Uh, three hours standing in water, uh, two hours of cleaning salt water out of my tripod, about 900 fr frames, uh, about 20 hours of post-processing. Um, some wild pigs um, were hanging out in the area, um, kind of scared me a little bit. Um, the mosquitoes were terrible. Um, this is a another view of me, my tripod out there in the, the water. A couple tripods. If you can see Olus, he's way over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so right behind me, about uh, 20 yards behind me, was a, um, a mama wild pig and uh, about five or six of her babies. And they came out right at the sunset and <clears throat> scared me a little bit. So, uh, yeah, they were right near my backpack. So not fun. So there's a lot involved with doing some of these. Um, and, you know, for the one or two decent ones that I've got, I've got a whole bunch of others that just didn't turn out for one reason or another. Um, so there's a lot of effort involved in the time lapses themselves. So let me talk a little bit about processing the time lapse. Um, you know, one important thing to note here, I'm shooting a, a Nikon Z7 or a D850. Um, the images are big. Um, and when you're talking about 900 images, uh, that you're going to process into a time lapse, um, it takes up a lot of storage space. Um, and so I have this Pegasus uh, six bay 30 terabyte uh, Thunderbolt storage device uh, that I use to store a, a lot of these uh, time lapses and the images associated with them. Um, also, it's pretty processor intensive. Uh, this is not a memory thing to process these time lapse, it's processors. You need cores and you need uh, core speed. Um, so, um, you know, the, the more the better because it can really take a long time. Um, so I use Adobe Lightroom to compile the uh, initial images and uh, then I use a tool called LR Time Lapse, uh, which I mentioned before. Uh, this helps you create keyframes and um, writes back and forth between uh, Lightroom and so it allows you to uh, edit the images, each individual image if you want um, uh, to manipulate in the time lapse. Um, and then I use well, uh, Adobe Premiere Pro to add some sound and title overlays and things like that if, if you want. Uh, so here's the process flow for processing a time lapse. So load the images as DNGs into Lightroom, um, sync that folder in LR time lapse and create your keyframes. So the keyframes are the frames that you're going to actually go back and edit specifically. Uh, typically, you want to capture frames that um, are where light's changing or where something has happened. So you import that back into Lightroom after you've done the, the keyframes. Uh, you edit those keyframes. Um, there's, you know, in the normal way you would in Lightroom and you save the metadata. Then you read that back into LR time lapse. It's a it's the whole thing is going back and forth between Lightroom and LR time lapse. Um, you apply the deflicker, you save it, and then you save all of that metadata back to the individual images in Lightroom, and then you export all of those images and combine them into a movie, and LR time lapse does that. So it's a bit of a process. Um, it does take a little while if uh, that's what you want to do, um, but um, I think the results are kind of cool. So um, I mentioned uh, Flickr. Um, so this is an image or this is a, an example of Flickr and I didn't really know about it until I started researching this and if you sort of look up in the sky, you can see the Flickr a little bit. Um, and what happens with Flickr is that every time your camera shoots, it resets your aperture. And so if you don't shoot at wide open with your aperture, it's going to 
go down to whatever aperture uh, you specified every shot and then go back up um, between shots. And so what happens is you get these minute little differences in your aperture uh, setting between images. And when you process it, um, you can get a little bit of flicker in your images. This is probably not the worst example I've seen, but there's a lot of examples out there that can be really bad. So it's good to always shoot wide open if you can. Um, also, LR time lapse has a deflicker flicker um, setting uh, that sort of smooths over the deflicker. flicker. Um, so it's a really nice tool for that um, if, if uh, you need to shoot uh, shut down a little bit. So uh, I'll just mention one other, a couple other things here um, is about motion in a time lapse. So ideally, when you're shooting a time lapse, you want to see something change, right? So it's going to be a sunset, it's going to be cars, it's going to be people, it's going to be clouds, something like that. But there's also ways that you can uh, put motion into your time lapse, um, and so that motion can be accomplished through a couple of different methods. So I recently purchased this thing called a move shoot move rotator. Uh, which has really two great functions. Um, and I, and I kind of would recommend it. I've, I've really enjoyed using it uh, in the limited time that I've had it so far. Um, one feature that it has is to allow you to move between shots. So it hooks up into your hot shoe on your camera and uh, you specify the speed that it moves and it allows you to basically take a shot, move a tiny, tiny bit, and then take another shot, move a tiny, tiny bit, and take another shot, move a tiny, tiny bit. Um, the other nice thing that the that the move shoot move does is it allows you it it, it uh, is a star tracker. So if you want to shoot Milky Ways um, without getting the star trails, uh, you can use this. It has a laser that goes with it that will align to the North Star, and uh, you can put this on your tripod, and um, then you can shoot your uh, Milky Ways with you know one two minute uh, intervals, um, and not get the star trails. So that's an added benefit. Um, also, I'll mention, you know, GoPros actually have some pretty nice features for shooting time lapse. Um, you can either shoot the, a time lapse movie or you can shoot time interval type uh, images, um, even nighttime time lapse as well. Um, and there's this little thing called a Movo. Uh, you can find them. I call it an egg timer um, uh, that you can use with your GoPro. Uh, it's basically just a, like a wind up egg timer and it goes click, 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 click. And, the, and your GoPro will can shoot through, you know, 30 minutes or an hour of moving. You know, it, it's, it's a little bit fast for a lot of things, uh, but it, it, it does work. And so, you know, if you want to experiment with um, doing time lapses and you have a GoPro, um, and play around with it. It's the nice thing about the GoPro is the images are much smaller and a little bit easier to deal with than you know your DLSR images. So here's an example of some motion and time lapse. Um, one thing I learned pretty quickly was um, uh, you want to make sure that your head is perfectly level when you do this. Um, because if you have your head unlevel, then you're going up or going down and then your time lapse looks really funny. And that's really, really hard to adjust in post-production. Okay, so a few final thoughts on the time lapse before I move to um, infrared. Um, make sure you think about your shoot in, in advance. Um, your composition, the motion, the time, the light. Um, battery life is also really important. If you're going to do a long time lapse, you really need to consider your battery life. Uh, make sure that you turn off the image review, Wi-Fi, anything else unnecessary that's going to eat up your battery lifetime. If you have, uh, you know, a camera that has an extra battery pack or something like that, that would be the time to use it. Um, uh, using live view keeps the mirror up. So this reduces the shake. You're going to get some better images. Um, I always, always, always shoot in raw. Uh, manual focus and make sure you check the focus carefully. I, it's just so frustrating to get a nice time lapse home, especially if you captured a nice scene and to realize that you missed the focus somewhere. Um, and this is something you should definitely practice at home before you go out in the field. Uh, it's very frustrating to, to have a really nice scene disappear in front of you while you're trying to get your camera set up on something like this. So that's my last slide on time lapse. I just want to pause and see if there's any questions before I move on to IR. I just have a few more slides on the. We do have slide. a couple. The, the first is what is exposure smoothing? Ah, so um, that's something that your camera does. You know, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a hundred percent sure exactly how it does it, uh, but it basically tries to smooth the exposure between the different frames as it goes through the interval shooting. Okay, and this the second is what is interval priority. 
Ah, so that means, um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, interval priority is um, telling your camera what's more important, your interval or the um, auto ISO settings. Um, so in other words, uh, if I set a 15 second interval and my auto ISO setting is at, uh, has a max uh, shutter speed of 17 seconds, um, it wants to know what's more important, the interval or the shutter speed. And um, you, you, you just want to make sure you have both of those set right so that it's not an issue. But, um, but you're, that's what the interval priority is, as I understand it. Hopefully I didn't get that wrong. Okay. That's all in the, that's in the chat right now. Okay. Great. So let me talk a little bit about infrared photography. Uh, so, by the way, I'll say that outside of time lapses, infrared is absolutely one of my passions. Um, I started with a, a really old camera that I converted, and um, I, I find that many of my favorite images now are infrared So um, that I shoot. So let's talk a little bit about what infrared is first. So um, without going into a ton of science, um, regular cameras or visible cameras uh, shoot in the visible range. And so that's somewhere between 400 and 700 um, uh, nanometers. Um, and all cameras, or at least most cameras, have filters in them to filter out infrared and to filter out ultraviolet so that we only get the visible. So, um, you know, some people have said, well, can't I just put a, a, an IR filter on my camera um, and be able to do this without converting my camera? And the answer is yes, but no. Um, if you do that, your camera is set to filter out most of that, that light. So your exposure time would need to be really huge to do this. I tried. Um, it just really is not, not feasible, um, especially for anything that has any motion whatsoever. And that includes clouds and trees wiggling and things like that. Um, so there's a couple important considerations if you are going to convert a camera for this. So the first consideration is the wavelength that you want to use, or do you want to do a full spectrum? And uh, the other one is, am I going to do it? Uh, am I going to put filters in the camera or am I going to put them on my lenses? So let's talk a little bit about both of those. So there's uh, pros and cons to both. So again, let me explain the difference here. So when you convert a camera, you can convert the camera to full spectrum, which means that it would capture ultraviolet, visible, and infrared, and then you put a filter on your lens. And that the advantage there is that you can change those filters and get any set of filters that you want, but you have to carry around filters to do that. Um, so the other way to do it is you actually say, well, you know what, I'm just going to pick a wavelength range and I'm going to convert the camera and I'm going to have them put that filter right in the camera. And then I can use any lens I want, right? So that's the pro of that is I can use, uh, if, I, if I'm using the ones, if I'm changing the filter in the camera, I can use any lens I want. I don't have to carry filters, but I'm limited to whatever I put in the camera. In other words, I can't say, well, today I want to shoot a different uh, wavelength range. Um, if you are converting to the full spectrum, you can use filters, any filter you want, but then you have to carry these filters around with you and make sure that the filters match the lenses that you have and things like that. So I will tell you that on my first camera that I converted, I did a full spectrum and I bought a bunch of filters. Uh, the second and third camera that I converted, I put the filter in the camera. So if that bears any to, uh, to witness to what I think is the right thing, but you, ha you have to decide on your own. The nice thing about also converting to a full spectrum is you can actually put uh, an appropriate filter on there and um, still shoot regular uh, as if a regular cam camera, although you got to worry a little bit about autofocus there. So this is, a, if you're really interested in this, this is something you should go out and research. Um, this is just um, an example of some different wavelength ranges and what you see in, in the camera or what you see in the image. Um, so I tend to shoot on the far um, right hand side of this um, in the uh, higher range where you get mostly just black and white. Um, but again, this is something you should research. Um, 
I strongly recommend lifepixel.com. Um, I've had them convert three cameras of mine now. They do a good job and they have a really good site um, that will show different images and even let you download raw images that they've shot, uh, actually this particular scene at different wavelength ranges with different filters uh, so that you can sort of do your own post-processing and, and see. So you can see in this image, there's a lot of color and such. And there are ways that you can do color manipulations. And if you like to do Photoshop and things like that, there are really cool things that you can do. I am not huge into manipulating weirdly colored images in Photoshop, um, but it, if, if you like it, then it's definitely something to consider. So uh, here are my setups. Actually, there's one setup. I, I, I didn't uh, modify this slide. My um, Nikon D810 uh, and I took a spill uh, this past summer shooting some waterfalls up in uh, North Carolina. And so that is no longer with me, um, but it has been replaced with the Nikon Z7 that I had converted. Um, so uh, that one I had converted uh, slightly differently, but I do really like the 830 nanometer filter in that camera. Uh, and then I have an Olympus. Uh, this was my first, my first camera was this Olympus a mirrorless uh, micro four thirds, which I converted to full spectrum, as I mentioned before. And I use, um, uh, by the way, I haven't shot this camera in, in forever. And if anybody's interested in it, I'm, I'd probably be willing to sell it with all the, the, the lenses and filters. But um, uh, it's, it's, it's a really cool camera just to play around with. Um, and you can sort of see different things. Uh, let me sh the, I have a couple examples coming up of some slides. Um, uh, that I shot with this camera with different wavelength ranges and you can sort of see what it looks like. Um, one thing I will mention uh, about uh, converting a camera, um, since IR is infrared is a different wavelength, your autofocus doesn't really work as well. Now that is for your regular DSR cameras. Your mirrorless cameras actually autofocus works just fine um, because it's a different autofocus system. Uh, but I will mention there's potential banding issues with uh, mirrorless cameras. So you got to be a little careful there as well. Um, so if you're using um, uh, the DLSR cameras, um, be careful that you do manual focus only. Also, not all lenses work well with IR. So um, an example is an Nikon. All versions of the Nikon 2470 do not work with IR. They get this really weird hotspot. Uh, this is a really bad example in this in this picture, uh, but that's basically what it looks like. And it is not something that you can edit out of your image whatsoever. Believe me, I've tried. Um, so um, also the IR capture is usually slower. So I'm always, almost always using a tripod with my IR. So as I mentioned before, um, some, some example images from my OMD. Um, if you like really, you know, kind of funky colored images, uh, these were at uh, different wavelength filters uh, when I shot them. Um, and so, you know, you get some really kind of cool effects. Um, in the end, I find that I just like the black and whites. Um, but what I've learned is the more different colors you have in the image, um, the better you can actually convert them to black and whites if you want to. So, you know, there's some really nice sliders in Lightroom. If you convert to black and white, you can do different sliders for different uh, effects, um, even for that. So there, there are some advantages there. Um, you can do time lapses with infrared. So this is an example of a storm coming in um, out near the Gulf um, using my infrared camera. Um, the things that I find about infrared that I really like, uh, water, uh, clouds, and trees. Um, you get the combination of some nice clouds and water and trees together. Uh, you can get some really, really nice black and white images that look um, subtly different uh, than images that you can, can just convert from, uh, uh, you know, color images to black and white. Um, you know, if they're done well, people don't really recognize the fact that there's so much IR that's just black and white, and uh, they just think it's a, you know, kind of a, a really cool black and white image um, with a lot of contrast. Uh, so just a couple images of some of my favorite black and white images. This was, uh, again, over on the Gulf looking back. Uh, one thing about uh, images um, that you shoot with um, infrared, um, Unlike, you know, I'll shoot a sunset with my regular visible cameras. 
uh, shooting directly into the sun, you cannot do that with infrared at all. Um, you know, it's just way too much uh, infrared light coming at you when you do that. So you really need to make sure that you compose a scene where the light, the sun is uh, mostly behind you, you know, it could be off, off to one side of your shoulder, but you know, you don't want it uh, giving lens flare and things like that because um, it really does throw a lot of infrared light. Um, sometimes you see really unique things. So the, these, this pattern in the clouds here um, uh, for this storm that was coming in um, was not something I saw until I processed this image uh, from my camera. Um, you know, it was just really interesting patterns in the clouds uh, that uh, were kind of striking to me. Uh, and this is uh, one of my examples um, that just went lone uh, in the PPA um, from uh, in, uh, out in Canada. So some final thoughts. If you have an old camera sitting around that you're not using anymore, uh, it's a candidate to be converted. Uh, conversions, again, are about $350 plus or minus, depending on the camera and such. Um, it's a great way to be creative. Um, you get a whole different shooting process, a whole different way to look at scenes. Um, you still want to find good light, right? Uh, the nice thing about infrared is, uh, you know, you, most times if you're shooting landscapes, you're probably not going to be out shooting in the middle of the day. Um, infrared works pretty well in the middle of the day, but it's still nice to get some nice, uh, subtle, soft light uh, in the evenings with the infrared. But it is, it's, it's a lot better in the middle of the day than shooting your regular DLSR. Um, and then, of course, the same photo techniques you would use, panos, time lapses, and all of that stuff. And uh, that's all I have. So uh, are there any questions? Um, do you have a, yeah. oh. pers a specific um, place that you use to do your conversions? Uh, Life Pixel is the one that I've used uh, uh, three times. Okay. Uh, that I've used them. So um, they are, um, they're on the West Coast. Um, they do, they do a good job. Um, I, I, no, no real complaints. I think the big, if you're seriously considering it, um, I'd be glad to have a discussion with you offline about it. Um, but um, the biggest consideration again is, am I going to do it in camera or uh, filters that I'm going to put on, on the lenses? And um, that really determines whether, you know, um, you know, how, how much thought you're going to put into, you know, what filters you're going to use. It's, it's kind of a big, <laughs> it's, it's a hard to say, even after the, I've done it a couple times now, you know, that when I had just did my third one, you know, a few months ago, uh, because I lost my, my D810, um, I still struggled with exactly what I was going to do. And I did something a little bit different. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's kind of a big decision. Uh, so I have a couple of questions okay. in the, um, chat I'll ask real quick and then we can open it up for anybody else um, okay. can you contrast uh, and compare using an IR filter to get black and white shots versus shooting and just converting into black and white yeah um, so so first of all using an IR filter with a visible regular camera um, I don't recommend um, because you, most cameras have filters in them already that filter out that IR light. And so you, you would have to shoot a really long time. So I'm going to assume that the question means a converted camera versus, uh, just turning a, an image from black to white. Um, I find that, um, I don't know. I, I like the fact that you can turn the, the sky dark. Uh, which is not something that you can easily do with uh, a, a visible image uh, on in black and white. So, um, you know, the way you get different contrasts and the amount of contrast that you get, um, I find I like in IR better. It might be a personal preference. Um, you know, Olus and I have uh, competed, uh, you know, friendly between each other. He's converted some really beautiful images to black and white. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think you can, you can definitely do that. There are some techniques uh, that you can use with a, with a color camera uh, to manipulate your black and white images really well. Uh, Lightroom has some great stuff. Um, there's some other tools out there that you can use. So, um, you know, if you really love your black and whites, um, you can certainly play around with that. Um, and, and, and see what you can do. Um, I, I think it's maybe a matter of personal preference in the end. We have a specific one about the um, uh, Nikon DX 15 to 55 
do you, do you yeah, I assume that would work okay? Um, there is a website that lists all of the good and bad lenses. Uh, the 15, I'm sorry, which one was it again? 15 to 55 f2.8. Um, I don't have that lens, so I cannot comment. Um, I don't remember that being one that was a bad one, um, but there are some websites that will that will give you information on whether the uh, the IR characteristics of different lenses. I know for a fact that the 2470s are not great, and um, even even the new Z 2470 is not a good IR lens. And there's some others out there that are marginal. Um, some of them depend on the aperture that you use. As you shut down the aperture more, they get worse. Um, if you shoot wide open, but oftentimes for landscape, you're not shooting wide open. So, um, yeah. Okay. Send the um, lens to uh, lens pixel when you have that, uh, redone to calibrate. So what you do. I've never done that because, um, you can. So, so the, so the question was, do I send my lens to lens pixel or life pixel to have calibrated? So the idea uh, there is that, um, the autofocus is different when you convert the camera to IR. So the autofocus won't work uh, with your normal lenses, but um, you can send a lens with your camera and LifePixel will calibrate that lens, the autofocus for that lens uh, with your camera. So um, the reason that I haven't done that is that, first of all, I use different lenses. I don't use just one. Um, second is that most of the time I'm shooting landscapes, and most of the time when I'm shooting landscapes, I'm using manual focus anyway. So the autofocus has not been important to me. Uh, so I've never bothered having them calibrate my autofocus. And so with your Nikon all, setup, with your Nikon setup, the only lens you're not using is a 2470. For the most part, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I'll also, uh, uh, let me just okay. also say one other thing. The mirrorless, the Nikon Z, the autofocus works just fine because the mirrorless camera does the autofocus on the sensor. Uh, so you know, if you're if you're considering, so I, I believe Sony would do the same, right? So any mirrorless camera, if you want to convert that, my my um, uh, you know the mirrorless cameras are going to uh, do fine with that. But the disadvantage is that, and I've seen this, and I wasn't aware of this um, uh, when I converted my Z. There's a little bit of banding um, at uh, if you if, if your ISO is really low, um, you can get a little bit of banding uh, in the image. It's easy to filter out um, with some uh, noise filters, uh, but it's a little disappointing that there's some banding there with the um, uh, the camera. So if you're converting a Nikon Z, you might want to check into that uh, about the banding. I'm not sure about the Sony's on the banding. Okay. Have you ever used IR film? Okay. Uh, I'd love to. Um, last. I do have oh, a sorry. Sorry, go I ahead. have a question. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, are we open for questions at this point? Well, yes. I've got a few more in the in the chat, but go ahead. Oh, we'll do those first. Sorry. Okay. Um, what camera did you convert last, Keith? The the, the a Nikon uh, Z7. Nikon Z7. And do you ever get any out chromatic aberration with IR? Uh. Not that I've had a problem with, not that I can remember at least. Okay. Go ahead, Bill. You're on mute. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm off mute. Uh, LifePixel makes a, a and, and I know this to be true, you can't get to certain values for uh, color balance in Lightroom or Photoshop how are you handling that? Um, I'm not familiar with what you're talking about. You can't get to certain values for like you need like a, a, a white balance of like 200 or something. They should actually show it in the example, but they say that you can't really get there when you're working on the raw files. Um, so I'm not, I have never been totally able to understand it, but it's on, it is on their example page, the one that you were showing that the sample photos. Yeah, yeah. They say you can't shift. Yeah, so 
on this photo, they're talking about the fact that you cannot shift the, the white balance. And I couldn't understand, well, what do you do? They talked about using Nikon's, you know, raw converter or Canon's raw converter. And I'm, I'm Olympus might be interested in that body of yours, by the way. Um, uh, but I don't know. I've never quite figured out what to do with that and, and whether, so I wanted to um, check with somebody so, who used the camera. Okay. So I think, um, so a couple things. Um, I'm not positive I'm able to answer your question really well, but let me try. Um, so one of the nice things about LifePixel is if you convert a camera with them, they have this guru, his name's Dan Wimpler, I think. Um, and he'll set up a free half hour with you to go through, you know, your conversion and any questions you have about post-processing. And so I did this on my last conversion, on my previous conversion. And one of the things that Dan was saying was that white balance was really important to him. And that the way that the, that he, his, the point that he was making, which I found very interesting in general was um, Adobe only hacks the uh, real raw files uh, for how they get the raw files to open with their, their converters. And that it's not a true conversion uh, of the raw files. And that the only way to do a true conversion, a proper conversion of the raw files is to use the, um, the software from the, the, the camera supplier. So in this case would be Nikon. Um, and so he was going through with me about how it's better to use the Nikon uh, converter uh, to do your, uh, at least your original processing through your white balance. Now, um, I'm going to plead a little bit stupid in that I don't do that. Um, I don't like that extra step. And what I do when I process my images, because I'm going to black and white, um, is I just sort of move those the sliders for white balance until I get something that I like in the image. Because again, it's going to be black and white. Um, and so I don't know that there is a perfect white balance uh, for a black and white image. Okay, that's so just, basically, no. way I go ahead. Okay, so basically ahead. you bring in the image, you hit the black and white button in Photoshop, and then you just play with the, with the white balance sliders. Yeah, and basically what you get with the white balance sliders is it either goes, you, you'll, I find that it reaches sort of a peak in contrast and beyond that, it just goes really bright or really dark. And I just kind of hit that peak in contrast, wherever that is, call that good. And then I go into the different, um, um, different colors in the white balance or in the black and white, you know, the conversion part. And I play around with those. Okay. So that's the way, that's the way I do it. Now, if you were Thank trying you. to take this image and, and you're trying to make this image look like, you know, a blue sky and, you know, yeah, okay, white balance maybe is really important there. Um, and, you know, then somebody else would have to help you with that because I couldn't, that's not the way I do it. So, no, and I'm mostly interested in doing monochrome, so it, it may be not much much of an issue for me. But, but to your original question about LifePixel doesn't do anything to the camera that limits anything with the raw file different than what you had before. All they do is they put a filter on the lens or in the camera. Right. And I, I kind of knew that. I just, they, they, they kept talking about how, how you need to go to either your camera's software or whatever. And I thought, well, if you're not doing that, then there must be a way around it. Yeah, it's, I think that's only to really capture the most out of the white balance of the image and, and to give you more uh, range for processing. I just haven't yeah, found probably it. Probably more important in color. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Hey, have you seen any, aside from the focus differences, have you seen any quality differences between the, the Z and your VA-10? Aside yeah, the from the pixel differences. The, the banding. The banding. banding. As a negative. As a negative for the yeah. Z. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Had had I had I known that that banding was going to be an issue, I probably would have converted an eight fifty.
Any other questions? No, thank you for me. I'm yes. going to, um, if I can figure out how to toss this link into the chat. This was, um, this is that time lapse video that I was showing uh, with the different um, uh, different seconds and different intervals. If you want to watch it, uh, just copy that out to YouTube. Any other questions for Keith? Well, firstly, Keith, I found this very fascinating. I want to thank you very much for taking the time to present to us tonight. I know it's never easy to get ready for these things, especially when you're busy like you are. So I, I want to say thank you so much, and we really appreciate it. Thank very you for having me. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you, Keith. It was thank great, you. Keith. Thank you, Jean. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you Thanks very much. much. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Keith. Good night, John Boy. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, take care. Take care, everybody. Good night, Gary Boy. <laughs>